everybody, how's it going? Dan Schinder here, live if you're watching live, or on the archive if you're watching after we were live, something like that. Coming to you on Drum Talk TV from Globe, Arizona, 100 miles east of Phoenix, up in the mountains, away from most of the commotion. And I'm here with a first-time hazing, I mean, first-time guest, Steve Negus, who has an amazing <laughs> solo album. Steve, you're coming to us from the Hamilton Grimsby area, right? Yes, uh, the Great White North, which is not so white at the moment. Which That's is good. right, quite smoky. Very smoky, yeah. Cool. Those those Quebecois are smoking way too many cigarettes, and it's <laughs> it's getting in the atmosphere, and it's coming here. <laughs> well, I'm really excited to talk to you. I've been a fan of your music for a long time, and to, to connect with you and find out that you have a solo album was like, oh, I love when drummers come out with solo albums. I love when drummers write music. I love when drummers are also producers and arrangers. And I'm going to bring the show up, folks, like I always do over here, so I can see comments. Let us know where you're watching from. Let us know if you have a favorite work by Steve, one of his other bands. Um, you may have heard of Saga, Flood, some other projects. Chime in and let us know if you have questions for Steve, and I'll relay them. We'll get to your solo album in a minute, but first, I would love to know from the beginning, why the drums? What was the inspiration? And was that your first instrument, Steve? Yeah, you know, there's a funny story. Uh, my dad had a twin brother, and evidently he gave me a drum for my first birthday because he wanted to upset my dad. <laughs> so that's the story. I don't remember that, but that may have something to do with it. It got in my psyche somehow. <clears throat> I don't know. I was always interested. I mean, at, at probably at the age of seven and eight, I was pounding on the furniture already. So, <clears throat> and that was, uh, that was at, at the time of surf music. So that's oh. when I really got, interested and it's funny because uh the instrumental music was big back then you know with the the ventures and all that stuff and it was great you know the, the wipeout and pipeline and that stuff Tell was popular Star and all there? that stuff that stuff was popular up there oh yeah yeah i mean the beach boys was my first album wow you know Little new scoop, and I was listening to uh, Jan and Dean and the Hondells. And <clears throat> yeah, so I was hooked long before I ever heard of the Beatles, that's for sure. You know, I mean, that changed my life too, but yeah, I, it was surf music, was the, the thing, you know, top 40 radio and Dick surf Dale. music. You know, I mean, we didn't, we never saw any surfboards up here, but snowboards, uh, yeah, the music. Yeah, snowboards. <laughs> Did you I don't go think snowboarding to Dick Dale music? <laughs> yeah, I, I never went snowboarding. So <laughs> that was a little bit after my time for yeah, that kind of stuff. Later. So, yeah. And, and did you play, uh, were you ever like in any school music programs, like concert band, orchestra, marching band, anything like that? Or was it something you did totally outside of academia? Well, I, I already had a band when I hit grade nine, when we started, when I started high school. So I thought, oh, yeah, I'm going to take music because I want to learn how to do this properly. And it's funny because they said you had to put down a second choice of instruments. I'm going, well, I want to play drums. Yeah, but you have to put down a second choice. So I went, OK, well, uh, saxophone, <laughs> just because I couldn't think of anything else. And sure enough, the teacher says, we already got enough drummers. You got to take saxophone. And I went, I think I'll take woodshop. <laughs> <laughs> wow. How interesting. So, yeah. So I went to the teacher and I said, I'd like a, uh, some private lessons. And uh, he was a pretty cool guy. He actually uh, lent me his uh, Dave Brubeck Time Further Out album. Oh, which yeah still is one of my favorites to this day. I mean, Joe Morello is, has always been on my 
top list of players. I, I got to meet him when, when I was endorsing Ludwig way back. And he was such a nice man. But I took two lessons. And uh, I was already playing beats. And like I say, I was playing surf music. And I had a band, a full drum kit. And they, he handed me a sheet of rudiments. And I'm sitting there going, right, left, right, right. And I just kind of looked at him like he was from Mars. <laughs> and I, after two lessons of that, I went, this, this is not for me. This is not working, you know? <laughs> So I ended up not taking music, even though that's really what I wanted to do. Mm, interesting. And uh, so I took wood shop and what else did I take? Uh, uh, machine shop and, and typing. And I'm glad I took typing now. Yeah. Because I can actually navigate these keyboards. But right. uh, I took everything else just because I couldn't get what I wanted. And I just continue with my bands at that time. Yeah. You know, all through yeah. high school. I mean, I had, I probably went through three different bands just in my high school era. Mm -hmm. Not, I remember playing my first gig at, at, I think I was 11 or 12. Yeah. That's good. nervous as hell, but uh, yeah. That's awesome. Was yeah. Joe so it, your it seems influence? The, uh, I'm sorry, was Joe your biggest or, or first influence? Well, it, I was in awe of what I heard because of all the time signature stuff, and I had no understanding of what was going on. But it, I just knew it was cool. Yeah. And uh, there's a drum solo on, on that album called Time Further Out. Oh, yeah. Which is, I think it's... I think it's in, it's in five, five, eight. And it's so cool. And I just remember I was totally blown away. It's still one of the best drum solos that I've heard to this day. And he's got his hi-hat clicking away. It's going one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one. Two. And he's soloing over it. And I'm going, how can he possibly do that? Yeah, the splitting you know, of the brain. I, yeah. Now, I've, I've spent... I've been obviously playing through that, that whole time period from back then. And it's funny that now I'm sort of come full circle and I'm starting to explore playing in seven, eight and five, eight and different time signatures. And uh, it's, it's really amazing. I love, I love it. Uh, you, you certainly have to wrap your brain around different things that, you know, we never did when we're playing at four four. Right. Yeah, it's a whole different thought process, literally. Got to know a little man. It is so. <laughs> yeah, as soon as you put threes into the equation, it messes everything up, you know, in a cool That's way. Funny. But you got to you got to sort of spend the time to understand how that works. So yeah, I wanna I wanna show everybody a couple videos. And the first video goes back to something you're a little bit more well known for, even though it's not from way back in the 80s. It's an 80s song that came out in 1981 that's being performed in 2003, if I remember correctly. And uh, this is at Aquafest in Hamilton, Ontario, so you didn't have to travel too far for the gig, which is cool. Um, but before I play something from way back, I want to play something from recently of a little snippet of a drum solo. And what I love about this, folks, is whether you're a drummer or not, you'll you'll recognize the, the funky groove in this short drum solo. Then we're going to go back in time to a song from 1981 in 2003. Check out this solo snippet first. Here we go. Steve Negus. That's right.
There's a little taste of some stuff. Now let's go back to a song that I think a lot of people will recognize. And then I want to give my kind of personal take on this. And then we'll move on to what you're doing now. We've got your solo album to talk about. We have a couple snippets of rehearsal from uh, you guys rehearsing one of your songs that's on the album. But first, here's Saga with Tonight We're On The Loose. Came out in 1981, the year I graduated high school a thousand years ago. Being performed in 2003. Check this out, folks. This is legendary. Dig it. figured we'd we'd get through my favorite part and then come back to conversation my favorite part is when everyone's doing those runs together complimenting each other and and saga when this material i've seen live from when you were with them is one of those bands like like quite a few really really good bands that were even better live the albums were great and i want to talk to you about working with rupert hine and it's interesting that he ended up working with rush a few years later um, but I always love live music first. And every band that I've ever bought music from, I've always purchased the live album first. And then it's weird going backwards to hear live versions that sometimes can be very different from the studio version, sometimes not mm -hmm. necessarily in the way they're played, but the difference in production. And when I think of buying Yes songs and then hearing the original Close to the Edge album going, what the hell's going on there? Same thing with Led Zeppelin. The <laughs> first album I got was maybe 
the first two studio albums when I was a little boy because I, I was really into them when I was seven, eight when that stuff came out. But then hearing the live version right. of the song remains the same compared to the studio version. It's like a whole different song, but you guys were so good live. How much went into that discussion wise or was it just a natural magic that this is what we sound like? Yeah, it was pretty much the case. I mean, remember when we started the band, we, uh, we had just basically flood broke up because Brian Pilling was uh, sick. And that was myself and Peter Roshan and Jimmy Crichton were the rhythm section, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which became Pockets, which was the first name for song. And we spent eight months in a rehearsal room for eight hours a day six days a week, writing the material for the first and part of the second album. So we were so tight that when we, that basically I, I can remember doing the first album, I think I recorded my drum tracks and I think it was a day and a half oh, and they wow. were supposed to be demos. They were supposed to be demos, but we were that tight that we could just go in the studio and I think we laid down probably eight tracks the first day and maybe six the second day wow. as far as the drums were concerned yeah <clears throat> and they were supposed to be demos but they we were so tight from being in that rehearsal room that the tracks they were we didn't need to redo them so they, that's what became the first that's album neat. i've never heard that before yeah, it, it, but like I say, when when you're playing eight hours a day for, you know, eight months on the same material over and over again, yeah, you know, refining it, having your little uh, squabbles and battles, and no, it should be this part, no, it should be that part. <clears throat> By the time we hit the studio, I mean, it was like it's like we've been playing this stuff for ages. Yeah. What we had, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was uh, it was so tight. And we always did that. I mean, we used to write in the same room with everybody playing. And uh, we would just basically work out all the fine details. I knew it. I remember uh, you were going to ask about Rupert Hine. Yeah. What was the <clears throat> process? Like? Uh, when, when, well, it was funny because when we, we uh, hooked up with him to produce Worlds Apart, and we got to the studio and we started laying stuff down and everything's sounding great and it's going great. And it's nice and easy. And Rupert turns to us and he says, what do you want me to do? He says, you guys have got this so down that there's nothing for me to do. <laughs> That's great. So, yeah, I mean, that great. was typical of the way we worked. We would sweat it out in a room together, you know? Yeah. So that when we hit the studio, it was just, uh, we already knew what we were going to do. That's awesome. And what was touring like back in those days? It's, it's the beginning of a new decade. You got this huge hit, this great album with a, a name producer. And now you're, you're playing basically all over the world, right? I mean, it's a huge launch yeah, we were into the stratosphere. Yeah, mo mostly Europe. I mean, obviously, Europe was our stronghold. America, we did well. I, I remember doing uh, three tours back to back. I was actually in the U.S. for six months. Wow. We did two months with Pat Benatar, two months with Jethro Tull, oh, and yeah. two months with Billy Squire. <clears throat> and we went right, we did some gigs in Ohio and the Midwest, and then out to Maine. And from Maine, right down the East Coast to Florida, Texas, California, three times in six months on a bus. Wow. And uh, I remember the, the Toll Tour, we played six nights on and one night off. So we got a hotel one night a week. The rest of the time, we we're on the bus wow. traveling to the next gig. <clears throat> so and, and then we would go from there, we would go to Europe and do a couple months on our own doing our own tours mm -hmm. so let me just get rid of i saw you on the tour with tall 
Oh, you saw that show? Yeah, in L.A. where I grew up. That was yeah. cool. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, it, it was a great tour. We, uh, Ian Anderson and Martin Barr, they, they brought their own ping pong tape. Oh. oh. So Ian Crichton and I would play ping pong with them every day. So we had these, you know, the, the saga versus Tull yeah. challenge going on every day. And and it was fun. Who won it more was a often? A lot of fun. I don't recall. I, yeah. I think they probably did because it was the you know they they were playing a lot more than we were. Yeah. And uh, I I don't really remember too much about it. Just that we did it. Right. You know they're British though, so they probably cheated. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a fun tour, you know, and and uh, like I said, we would go to Europe after that and do several months there. I think that that year I was home about two weeks in the whole year. Wow. Crazy. The rest and of the time we were on tour. So, yeah, I wanted to comment on um, that song because when it came out, I remember I was in 12th grade and no one had heard. I grew up in L.A., and no one had heard of Saga. And then here's this song that pops out on the radio. And the wonderful thing about it, and this is the magic of music, especially if you at all lean towards progressive rock as a music fan or a musician, there's that sweet spot where there's something there for the masses because you got to make everybody happy and pay the bills. But then there's something for the musos. And that came out so yeah. clearly in that song and even watching that video and listening to those runs back and forth together with the guitar and keyboards and complimenting each other. It's like, oh, I remember that, how that hit me the first time, but yet for someone who's just doesn't really understand what's going on, they can still move to it. You know, it's not like you try to dance to sound chaser by yes, you'll throw out a hip and break an ankle, you know? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny. I think, the, one of the things that made Saga different from most of the other progressives, like Yes, uh, is probably my R and B influence. Mm -hmm. And that's like, where that funk feel comes I would from, say, like from that solo that we watched. Exactly, uh, Tower of Power changed my life. Oh wow! So I mean, Dave Garibaldi is amazing. I love his playing, yeah. and. Uh, I actually way back when it, when I first heard them, I quit the band I was playing in because I had to play that music. Then when I went back to the rock stuff, I brought all my R and B chops with me, and I think it. Uh, if you listen to this August stuff, if you take the drum track out of the actual recordings, they're funk groups. Mm -hmm. It's R and B. Yeah. But what's going on on top is is progressive. Yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, you know, you could always tap your foot to what we were doing because that's, I would, and James Brown, you know, I was, I love that stuff. I was going to say, there's certainly that. that Clive Stubblefield overtone in there and Dave Garibaldi. I mean, what, what great, you know, studies to have in your toolbox. And speaking of a musical toolbox, um, I'm going to use a, uh, a five letter word that some musicians like, ah. but um, I think it's fair to say that there's some disco elements, not only in saga, but some music within <laughs> that spectrum. I mean, can you explain why it's important for musicians to expose themselves to different things, even if it's not their favorite music to grab a few nuggets to bring to what they do like doing because you kind of illustrated that with the r b but what, what's it the whole disco element that we still hear today in some music even if i may 1976 the presence album by led zeppelin and you listen to that last run in the outro of achilles last stand and john bonham's got the disco hi-hat going it's like it's everywhere whether we want to admit it might be a guilty pleasure or not like everyone's got a sequins unitard in their closet right musically yeah <laughs> there we go but, but what do you say about I, all I that i 
it is well but certainly when we start to talk about my new album yeah uh nothing is sacred i i mean basically any groove <laughs> there, there we it go. is it's all rhythm and and uh i i think uh disco music or dance music has elements to it that make you want to move and i once had a producer say to me if the people ain't grooving your records ain't moving it's a good <laughs> adage yeah it's true i mean uh, i i always look it's funny because a lot of people think that some of my stuff is quite difficult to play but I'm always looking at what I can take out as opposed to what I'm putting in, which is uh, why I think my fills are so recognizable. Mm. Uh, I watched, I watched uh, some of the Bernard Purdy stuff online, and he's he's always talking about these minimal fills where he just goes, Rotodopo, you know? Yeah. And it works, you know? It yeah. really works. He's such a nice man. So, those elements, I really think you, if you uh, use those elements in the right way, it allows the music to breathe. And then, you, then you're affected by the, the rhythms themselves. And as far as I'm concerned, you can borrow rhythms from anywhere. I, I've got a real love for Latin music mm. and studying some of the the afro-cuban rhythms and the brazilian rhythms i love them and i'm not afraid to take what's going on there and bring it into my own persona yeah and make it part of what i do right which is uh, quite obvious on some of the tracks in my new album right? yeah which folks you know is there's a definitely you know this is a, it's funny i was looking earlier this morning I, I thought, oh, I got to find the album cover online so I could pop it up on the screen. And then I looked down at my desk and went, oh, I'll, I'll just do that. <laughs> yeah. this, this is a great album. We're going to show a clip from one of the rehearsals um, filmed by your wife. And then we'll come back yes. and talk about the music. I can't wait for my first question. I'm curious if anyone's ever recognized this in your music on the album or ask you about it. But first, here's a quick snippet. <laughs> Love that. I wish it didn't cut off right there. I love that part. <laughs> so my yeah. first question yeah. in listening to your album, and this struck me as soon as the first track started, I'm going to hold the album up again for those who might just now be tuning in. Um, have <laughs> you ever done or thought of doing motion picture music, any scoring type work or providing soundtracks? Because that first track is like, took me, way deep into that world, if you will. It, it's very worthy. So I'm curious, the gathering and let the games begin. Just love that. Has that right. ever been on your radar? It has, and I actually think that this album might lead me there anyway. the uh, I don't know if you read the liner notes, but the vision for this album uh, what I was thinking, and let's talk about economy of motion itself for a second. Economy of motion is how you get better, how you get faster, how you get more fluid. And what I real, what both Kelly, my guitar player, and I realized is athletes do exactly the same thing. Right. It's just a different application. So like the 100 meter dash guys, 
they're looking at videos, watching their start, and they're trying to shave a fraction of a second off. So what I thought we would do for this album being instrumental, it still needs a vision. And the vision is like a, a, an Olympic event. Oh. That's why the first track is called Gathering, Let the Games Begin. And, and the visual picture for me is the, the athletes coming into the stadium. And that's such a uh, such a beautiful moment. I just, you know, I have a mental picture of that. Yeah. And that's kind of what I was trying to create by, with the whole orchestral thing, because they always have great music for those things, right? Yeah. You know, the... Somebody that intense buildup and the anticipation and the fanfare of the event and everything. Yes. And it, the album being as intense as it is, because it's pretty intense when you listen to it all the way through. Yeah. <clears throat> I that to me that's like the the that's the athletes competing, you know? Mm -hmm. And then at the end, of course, mm -hmm. you have the celebration, yeah, which is now my wife's favorite track. It's probably the closest to a, a saga type track on the album. Uh, and again, it's that same, it's the beautiful ceremony. Now you've you've done what you did, you won or you lost, it doesn't matter. Now you celebrate. Yeah. And that that's the yeah. feeling that that music gives me, uh, which ties the whole album together. Uh, so the theme, I don't know if you realize this or not, the uh, orchestral intro theme. it was called orchestral intro for before it became the gathering <clears throat> it's exactly the same theme you know where the choir comes in mm -hmm. which is actually a, a hundred voices that's i did 30 my wife did 40 and al who sang on my last album did 30 it's a hundred voice choir to get that nice yeah it's amazing fullness. too but the uh, the acoustic version, economy acoustic, is actually the same theme, and I wrote that first. Oh. So and when I I did the guitars, uh, we were right in the middle of COVID, and Kelly's lady is a little bit uh, um, susceptible to stuff. You know, she's not. I don't know how do you say that. Her, her health is not that great when it comes to. Uh, those kind of diseases, yeah. immune stuff. Yeah. So I thought, okay, well, I don't want to chance anything for her. So I'm going to do the guitars myself. So I, I did all the guitars on that track. I mapped them all out first. And then I went, okay, now I got to work on playing these because it's pretty demanding stuff. Yeah. Then I wrote the orchestral version after that. Oh, interesting. So then I thought... I wanted, I wanted something. I thought, okay, well, the album has to basically hit hit you right in the between the eyes yeah. right off the bat. So, especially with that theme, uh, I want a, full, yeah, I want a full on orchestra doing that. And it uh, sounds so cool. <laughs> it it is pretty crazy. But to get back to your point, I I think this album might lead to some sort of. Uh, work in that area the films i think somebody could probably take the whole album and make that a film oh that'd be neat but whether too. it happens or yeah not, it yeah. would be you know the whole structures there all the uh all of the 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 counterpoint things that you need to make a movie are all there yeah uh if you listen for example to late night mm -hmm. the reason i i put late night in there was because i wanted wanted the listener to have a break from all the uh, the syncopation and counter melodies and like the intensity so that you actually have a moment where it breathes you know yeah. so all of that i think could could lead it suggests movie even uh, the celebration itself is uh, really unusual in the sense that you've got a really nice uh, intro then you have the the memorable riff coming in, then it goes into a bass solo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like what? Yeah, yeah, and it's down. Yeah. It's totally down. I mean, who oh. does a bass solo that's that far down? Right. Yeah, it sounds awesome. And uh, 
And then then it goes back into the actual theme, but it goes straight time from the halftime. <clears throat> it's it's a little mini movie itself. Exactly. It's very thematic. Um, and talk about uh, your wonderful bandmates who did such a great job. And you've got a couple guests on keyboards as well. And like you mentioned, your wife sung. But talk about the lineup and how that came together and what the process was like working together. Yeah, when, when I st started working with this album, it, it was basically just the three of us. There was Kelly, Carol Luck, and Mike, who's the guitar player, and Mike D. Benedictus, who is the bass player. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of what I would do is when I was working on grooves, I especially in odd time signatures, like seven, eight and stuff like that, I would have Mike come in and we would just work on, on rhythm section stuff together. And then I would be in the control room. So then we'd start working on fleshing that out with keyboard parts to get that. And then I would bring Kelly in and, and we would work together and, and allow him to do what he does. Uh, he's a pretty incredible guitar player. Yeah. And uh, the three of us, it, it's just, we never had an argument or disagreement about anything. We just kind of let this album flow and what came out is what's on the album. And nothing was sacred, like uh, the, the guitar solo in Economy of Motion. I said, okay, Kelly, here's 64 bars, play solo. And that, that's, I say he played it solo. That's on the album. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and it, we were going, well, you know, we'll probably replace this stuff. And then, then when we actually went back, we went, why would we replace it? We, we were using uh, minimal gear. I mean, I think we had a, a Behringer pod for guitar, right? Oh, wow. So, I mean, it, it was nothing special. But what is special is it's, it's in the hands, right? Kelly's yeah. got a great set of hands. So... I mean, he could play it through just about anything and it would sound good. I mean, he's just, the, he's that good. Yeah, it know? shows through. So, yeah, yeah it, it's really inspiring to work with both of those guys. As far as uh, special guests, um, being the only real keyboard player on this album, uh, I was, was and still am trying to find the right guy to be part of this. You know, uh, so I contacted Peter Roshan, who was obviously the uh, original keyboard player from Saga. Yeah. And Peter and I always got along great. And, and quite often when I was thinking of keyboard parts, in the back of my mind, I would reference what Peter would play. What, what would he play here? Yeah. And that would help me come up with what I was looking for. So it was really great to have him come on and, and uh, play on, on the, the celebration. He did the piano solo, which is really cool. And uh, we would have done more, but Peter hadn't played in a while. When he was working up the tunes, he got tendonitis. Oh. So he couldn't play. Oh. Yeah, so it, it, he's like me, he plays too hard. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, we, we both like from our old rock days, we like to really lean in on things, as you probably just saw in that video. Yeah. Even for rehearsal, I yeah. like to lean in, you know, it's it's got to, you got to pull it out of the kit. Yeah. So it was great, great having Peter do that. I, I would have had him do a lot more. But uh, he also lives in the Dominican, so that, that kind of slowed things down a bit too. Yeah. And uh, the other guests, let's see, we had William Hare, who's a, a Toronto keyboard player, does classic albums, live stuff. He played the, actually the solo on, yeah, I need a CD. <laughs> I need my uh, magnifying oh. glass. Chase of the Thrill. Yeah, that's one of my favorite songs on, on the album, actually. It is the one thrill, of mine, too, yeah. actually. That that one uh, and the chase of the thrill and I agree with your wife. The celebration's great too. Yeah, uh, the, the the thing that you know uh, was really important to us 
was melody. Mm -hmm. uh, when I listen to jazz guys and, and they're playing all this great stuff and sometimes there just isn't enough melody, you can't take anything with you. So what happens is you, you go, oh, that was great playing, but there's nothing that goes in that you can remember. It was just, oh, it was great. Yeah. What was it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's like a so I, without really. Yeah. 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 So uh, the important, all of the stuff on this album, um, because we didn't have a singer on this, uh, melody actually became more important than if we had vocals on it. Yeah. Because yeah. I wanted, for on first listening, I wanted the listener to be able to take something away, you know, and then as you listen uh, further, you can start to get into all the nuances and, and all the, the counterpoints and the other stuff that's going on. But at least first listening, you walk away with something, right? Yeah. And I thought that was really important. Absolutely. And speaking of listeners, so it, um, our producer, Stephen Schinder, is popping in the link right now in the comments where you can go to to read about where to get the album and Steve will pin it to the comments. So whether you're watching live or on the archive, now there'll be a, a link there. And I, I highly recommend it. It's great. But I love how you explained the thematic side of it and the the everything you just said about an absence of a lead vocalist, the melody is what's going to make it. So rather than it just being a muso purge brain dump, you know, that no one can remember how the songs go. That's now the melody's job of the instrumental. Exactly. I, I think it's like I say, I think it's more important with the instrumental instrumental music than uh, even with the singer, you know, yeah. Steve, what do you like you, most you don't about have the words, produce? But... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. There's like a little delay for the say... weirdness. <laughs> but go ahead. You don't have the words, so you've got to move people with melody and, and rhythm. Right. And uh, I think that's a really powerful combination. And, and I, I love exploring, uh, taking it different places and, and lots of surprises. You know, I don't think you should always be able to predict what's coming next. Yeah. And just like a, in a movie, right? If a movie is predictable, you kind of go, yeah, I know what's going to happen. He's going to shoot that guy and then blah, blah, blah. Uh, music can be very much like that, too. You know, OK, yeah. yeah, it's going here. It's going there. You know where it's going. Yeah. And I don't think that has as much longevity as something that has surprises. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a carryover from the saga days. A lot yeah. of the saga music was like that. You know, and, and it's still very much an important part of what I do, you know? Yeah. But that's why I spend so much time exploring a groove before I record it, right? Yeah. I need I to know that. where else can this go? Yeah. What, what do you like most about the producer role and how has having been a drummer helped you as a producer? Well, all of the, the music starts with the rhythm. Mm -hmm. This is all very rhythm driven, but uh, I, I think what happens is, is uh, out of necessity, I sort of took on the roles of doing as much as I could. Mm -hmm. So that's why I learned how to play keyboards. Not that I'm a great keyboard player, but it, it's all it's all the same twelve notes. So you 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 develop an understanding for where you can go and what you can do with chords and how uh, chords can affect your your state your feeling yeah <clears throat> so the engineering came along initially because i years ago uh i was in a studio in toronto this is way before flood uh and i was working with this quote famous canadian engineer and uh i i had a nice open sound on on my kit i went out for coffee and i came back and he had taped everything. 
and the drums then sounded like cardboard boxes and I wanted to kill him. I really wanted to kill him, but I didn't. And uh, what I realized is if you want something done the way you hear it, you're probably the only person who can make that happen. So that's why I got into engineering is really because I, I wanted to understand how I get my sound, whatever that is. I love and that. then I had to figure out because it's hard to be both sides of the glass at the same time. Yes. So I had to figure out how to get a system together so that I can engineer and play at the same time, you know, so I have this setup in my studio. So I have two recording setups. I have what you can see behind me here is the, uh, this is my control room. Mm -hmm. And the video clip you just showed of rehearsal, that's my studio kit. And that's constantly set up. So I play that every day. But I also have another recording set up for that. Mm -hmm. So all the levels for all the mics, there's 20 mics on the kit. It's all set up, ready to go. So I just take the laptop in, plug it in, and I'm ready to record. That's cool. So I do all prepping here. It's all part of the same thing. What, what happens is you, you work on fine-tuning the process mm -hmm. on how you get from A to B. And that's really, uh, that's why I got into keyboards. I started playing guitar about 14 or 15 years old, too. So uh actually taught myself keyboards from guitar oh. i actually got somebody in in high school days uh i got somebody to show me what the notes were on the piano and then i voiced i figured out from the guitar chords what the notes were and then i voiced them on the piano so it's interesting when you do that because you voice you don't voice like a normal piano player you know, the yeah. thing about guitar is it's root five octave. You know, that third is nowhere to be found. Right. So you and you start playing fifths, right? There's your rock and roll stuff. Yeah. You're playing exactly. fifths. Get the third, right? Yeah. So yeah. just learning that stuff. Uh, I always had, I have a quest for knowledge and I, I want to understand and I want to be better. So exploring rhythms exploring melodies exploring chords it's all part and parcel of the same thing it's a language so the better i can speak my language the better off i am exactly you know? yeah and i love this that. album love is really a, a culmination of that because i explored so many different rhythms in chase of the thrill i'm actually playing five underneath seven so I'm playing in 5-8, the guitars in 7-8. Yeah. Before I started this album, I never dreamed I would be doing things like that. That's awesome. But it makes sense musically. Yeah. You I, know, wanna I mention, mean, you can do that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I want to mention, because Steve sent me a note. He's got the link in there, but where the link leads to, he doesn't see where there's a buy button. What is the site where people can get the album? He's got in there... It, um, the stevenegas.com slash economy hyphen of hyphen motion. But I don't think there's a buy button on there, is there? Not at the moment. My uh, okay. website is uh, broken at the moment. Okay. Can the only place, the only place, yeah, the only place you can get a hold of me, and this is what most people are doing, is through Facebook. Okay. And there's the Negus uh, group page, okay. which is, uh, where most of my uh, fans are anyway. Uh, that's it. You can contact me directly and- And, uh, and it's facebook.com slash Nagus group. Is that it? Oops. Is it- um, No, it, Facebook. I'm just on Facebook. But what's the actual page name? Nagus group? Nagus, the continuing saga of Steve Nagus. Okay, Steve will look for it and, <laughs> and pop it in there. Um, so I have two more questions before we run out of time, Steve. And and thanks again okay. so much for making time for this. We're going to spread this around to our YouTube channel, our Instagram channel, our Vimeo channel, and we'll repost it a few times as well. My last two questions are this. Having traveled so much 
around the world playing music. Is there somewhere left on the map that you've never been to that would be first on your bucket list? Other than my house, of course. I have two. Okay. Brazil and Japan. Ooh, both uh, for music and food. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I love sushi, obviously, and I love sake. That's good stuff, too. So um, Saga never went to Brazil, Japan? Saga didn't go to Japan? No. I would think you guys would have been no. huge there. Yeah, it just never happened. I think there was one point we were about to do some dates in Japan, and we ended up doing that that stint in in the U.S. for six months. Oh, okay. So we did the, the Benatar, Jeff Rotel, Billy Squire, back-to-back-to-back uh, -back -to -back tours. Yeah. And that came in the time period when we were looking at going to Japan. So we never got that. Okay, you'll love it. It's wonderful. We did two Taiko documentaries in Japan. And our oh, documentaries cool. not only include the music, but the food, the architecture, the culture, the history, and it was uh, amazing. It was it was great. And Brazil, of course, awesome food, awesome music. You mentioned your affinity for Afro-Cuban and Brazilian music and all that. So those are two great choices. So of all your travels you have done, where did you have the best food that you had maybe never had before or didn't have that authentic version of it from where it was from? That's a tough one. I Obviously, Germany was so high on our, our list that, uh, you know, we, uh, the, the whole German culture, I ended up marrying a, a German lady. So oh. I, I do love the German culture. Scandinavia is obviously wonderful too, and they have great food up there. Uh, particularly, I mean, Hamburg is great. You know, I, we have family there and we go there quite often. Oh, great. And all the seafood. I love seafood. So, yeah, that's that's really good. I, I like uh, I like the spicy stuff, too. I like, actually like like Indian curries and stuff like that. Yeah, me too. I think all the traveling, uh, it opens you up to so many different things. Uh, one of the coolest things is, is you learn about the culture. Yeah. And the social graces. That I, I think, especially we as Canadians, have a tendency to overlook. The Americans as well, the, the ones especially who don't get out and travel, which is a lot, a lot never leave and see the U.S. from the outside, let alone learn about other people elsewhere, which helps us learn about ourselves. I don't mean to get too mushy and corny, folks, but anyone that's traveled knows this. Yeah, and, and uh, there's just... So much to be learned from all the different cultures that uh, I find myself in, say, musical or food or just the culture itself. Uh, if you take those things in and you kind of let them wash over you, they become part of your persona, which changes the whole game, right? Yeah. It changes everything. And I love that. I, I don't think of myself now as, as strictly Canadian. You know, I think more musically and, and culture-wise, I've become some sort of hybrid, which I think is a wonderful thing. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah, so yeah it just, uh, it's it's great. It, there's, so, there's so many different things out there that uh, I think we have a tendency to be way too closed-minded when it comes to accepting different. Yeah. You know? Different is good. You can learn from that and you can experience and enjoy. You just have to open yourself up. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's important. I think that's how you get better at whatever it is you do. Yeah. That's so nicely put. Some very, very wise words from an excellent musician with a great new solo album you've got <laughs> to get, folks. Steve's putting another link in there. And Steve, we'll have to do this again sometime. Stay on the line with me after we say goodbye to the audience. I want to thank you very much again for coming on. And I want to thank everybody so much for following what we do here on Drum Talk TV. We have more big news coming regarding our membership site soon. And we're releasing three songs starting in the next couple of days from our big 10-year anniversary show. 
And uh, hopefully you'll all enjoy that. Um, and thanks so much for following what we do. Steve, hang on the line. And everybody else, watch for more fun stuff on Trump Talk TV. Thanks, everybody. Cool.